Okay. So we have uh, spent much time translating our original energy function, uh, which depended on, where is it? Here. Uh, we've spent much time translating our original energy function, which depended on variables z, into an energy function uh, that now depends on mu, and uh, as desired, the objective is linear in mu. Yeah, so uh, I could write the objective as uh, vector mu transpose c, just as we want it, or, or mu transpose psi, let's say. Yeah. But uh, you have remarked at the end of the last hour correctly that if, if we only had this objective function, then the solver would be free, if all our potentials are non-negative, to just make everything, make all the mu's zero, and we would not get out of labeling at all. So we need this constraint that uh, if we sum over all possible labels k at a given, uh, for a given vertex i, then at least one of them must be or well the sum of them must be one now if i imposed only this condition then potentially the solver would have the freedom uh, to to set uh, one of the mu's associated with uh, variable i to value of plus two and one to a value of minus one and that would still add up to one yeah, if all the others are zero so we also need to say that uh, they should be non-negative, but that would still allow for fractional solutions. And we want exactly one of the entries, so for one of the labels to be one and the others to be zero. So this is why uh, we use this uh, Boolean constraint here. So only values of zero or one are allowed. Uh, so these two here taken together, they make sure that each vertex in the solution must be associated with exactly one state. Now, can you imagine another problem arising? And this is, of course, what the other equations here address. Yeah? Precisely. You said that perfectly. Huh? So uh, let's say, and that's what the sketch here tries to say. Uh, you know, what if I come up with a solution? I set this one to one, this to zero. Okay. And then I say uh, for the indicator vector for my pairwise interaction, I set this one to one and the others to zero. Uh, it would be, you know, binary, that's fine. But, you know, we have a mismatch uh, here between these two. Uh, because uh, the unary factor tells me that it's the second state which should be on and the first state which should be off. And this is now not reflected in the pairwise term. I hope you can see this with so many scribbles on top of each other. Um, Is it clear what I tried to say just now? We need consistency between the unary choices, or we need consistency between the labels picked for the random rules associated with the pixels, and we need and between consistency, consistency between them, and consistency with the new variables that we've introduced to code for the pairwise interactions. If not, please ask. <coughs> okay. Um, so we somehow need to say that uh, the projection <coughs> of each row must give us the values that we observe here. And the projection of each column must give us the values 
that we associate with uh, these urinary indicators. And this is what the projection that I've been talking about is what this equation here does. It says that if I sum over all states L that are associated with variable J, then I must come up with the correct marginal. Now this equation alone, okay, let's say this equation here is for the uh, columns. Uh, this equation here is for the rows. But if I used only them, I could maybe still imagine uh, having positive and negative entries that somehow cancel to give the correct marginal. And to prevent this from happening, I could use either the 0, 1 constraint, or I can also just use the non-negativity constraint here. Okay, and it's only taken together with these constraints that my new energy function, which is linear in mu, really expresses the same thing as my original energy function. Okay, now where are the problems? Um, well, on the one hand, we have a very large number of summons in our objective function. Uh, so each of our million random variables can be in each of 20 states. And then we have these, you know, even more for the pairwise interactions. And then we have very many constraints also. So between uh, each two random variables that interact. Uh, can you guess or argue, by the way, which of these constraints is the bad one computationally? Or which is the one that makes the problem hard? Okay, well, come to that in a moment when, when we look at the picture. Yeah. So uh, writing this thing more compactly, the black box on top, the big black box, uh, I get out, you know, this thing at the bottom here. Yeah? So my objective, I can write it as C transpose mu. Um, all these constraints, I can write them as a matrix uh, operation as A times mu must be no less than B. And I have the integrality constraints on some of my elements mu. Uh, now you might argue that, uh, but look, here I had an equality and uh, down there I had an inequality. And um, there is a trick to write an equality constraint in terms of two inequality constraints. That's what's shown here. So if I require that A times mu be identical to B, then that's the same as requiring that a mu should be no more than b and no less than b. And if I now multiply here from the left side with minus 1, then I get the thing on the right hand side. And then uh, I can stack this. Yeah, so I can stack these two here to get uh, the matrix which you see on the bottom. And this can be written again in the form of some uh, matrix, not A, but I should call this M or something here. No, no, it's correct. So A times mu equals B is equivalent to the thing that you see on the right hand side. This is correct. Okay. Good. So we have rewritten the thing as an integer linear program. And at this point, uh, we can just invoke our solver and uh, not worry about the internals. But we'll look at the, at the principle of what the solver does in any case. Um, so what's the strong side of this? The strong side is that the approach is completely generic. So any discrete pairwise Markov random field, we have now seen how to translate it into an integer linear program. 
and then I just use one of the existing solvers. The downside is that uh, the solver may not be able to find a solution in a useful amount of time or, or ever. Uh, that's depending on how difficult the Markov or how frustrated the Markov random field is that you gave to the solver. Yeah, so Markov random fields can exhibit varying degrees of frustration. And the more frustrated they are, the more difficult it is to find an optimum solution. So let's look at the geometry, uh, at the uh, you know at the internals of what such a solver does, uh, and I've called this here the geometry of integer linear programs. So here on top is again the equation. Um, the thing that I've put in the green box is called a linear program, and um, these are fairly cheap to solve. So you can uh, yeah, really solve here problems on millions of instances, no problem. Uh, it's the integrality constraint, which is uh, the hard part, uh, as I'll show in a sketch in a moment. And then it depends on how frustrated your problem is. Yeah? Um, so in the following, I will say that uh, my matrix A for the constraints uh, is a collection of rows, which are here called A1 up to AM. And if I require that uh, A mu be no more than B, I can write this as a set of constraints, one for each row of my matrix A. And this is the thing that has here been uh, underlined in yellow. Yeah, so uh, if you look at this, this would be the Eulerian form of a line or of a plane. And if we require that A mu be no more than B, then this defines us a half space. So each row of A induces a half space in which my solution mu has to lie. And uh, now this intersection of half spaces uh, could be empty. So for example, if I want my solution to be outside these half spaces here, you know, there's just uh, no way to satisfy all these constraints. Huh? Then this intersection of half spaces can be empty. Uh, or, you know, hopefully it will not be empty, so hopefully there will be at least one feasible solution. And in this case, we have a polytope. So polytope is a geometric body which is delimited by planes. Uh, polytope is always convex. Okay, uh, so I have here at the bottom a picture, you know, pretending that my matrix A has three rows. Um, these three rows induce these uh, three half spaces. Yeah? So I'm saying, for example, my, what did I say? It has to be less than B. Okay, so these are the normal vectors pointing out. Um, so these are the three rows which all induce a half space. And then the feasible space is uh, the inside of this polytope here. Yeah, it's the yellow area. And then we have this uh, reward vector. So we said here that I want to maximize C transpose mu. And the reward vector, you know, I have invented one and shown it in pink. I've said the reward vector here points uh, in the first quadrant, it, per it points upwards. So if I now look for the solution, which gives me the biggest reward, but is still inside the yellow area, then my optimal solution, that was the wrong pen, excuse me. It's 
is going to be this one here. Yeah? This is the LP solution. And by the way, I'm just completing the picture that we see above. It's just that the picture above is so busy that you know I'm trying to fill it step by step. So this would be the solution to the linear program. And um, unfortunately here, um, this would be a fractional solution. Yeah? So if you look at the coordinates, of this point here, then uh, none of the coefficients of my vector view of my vector mu, in this case I have just two components of my vector mu, none of them are exactly zero or one. Uh, or let's not talk about zero one, but let's talk about integrality. So none of, neither is integral. So this would not give me a valid solution to an integer linear program. So the integrality constraint says that uh, not only do I want the best solution from inside the polyhedron, from the yellow area, but in addition, I only, I only admit integral solutions. And now I have a problem because when I copied this, I made a mistake. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now I've put uh, red dots at all the permissible solutions. So I've put a red dots at, at all the coordinates which are inside the polyhedron and which give me integral values for mu zero and mu one. Yeah, so they lie at the intersection of my uh, of my underlying grid here. And that means instead of looking for the best place in this convex polyhedron, I now need to look for the best red dot. And the problem is that uh, while the inside of the polyhedron was convex, this set of red dots is no longer a convex set. And for optimization, this is bad news. Yeah? So in, in optimization, you don't need to be afraid of nonlinear optimization problems. So nonlinear is not a problem. It's non-convex that is the problem. And we now have a non-convex set. So we need to somehow, you know, systematically visit or at least systematically rule out uh, subsets of these uh, solutions until we until we're left with a with an optimal one. Now, by the way, you know if you if you look at this kind of problem for the first time, you may be tempted to suggest, well, how do we go from a fractional solution to an integral solution? You may be tempted to say that, so in this example here, at least the LP solution is fractional. Fractional. You may be tempted to say, let's just round. Uh, but if I now round to the closest integral solution, I would end up here. And that's not a legal solution uh, because I'm not in my polyhedron. So just rounding won't work. Uh, I could, and you know, rounding to the closest point inside the yellow region, well, that's not obvious uh, how to do that. Uh, and moreover, even if I could round to just the closest point, to the closest integral point, uh, this solution could still be a very, very bad one. Uh, let me see if I can try and construct this. Um, so the reward vector was pointing in uh, this direction. So the reward vector points here. And Okay. 
Okay, so I, I did not manage to produce an example here, which I did not manage to produce an example which shows that uh, rounding inside can give you a bad solution. But I can at least show you an example where the integer solution is very far away from the LP solution. Yeah, so here, this would be the LP solution. And the closest integral solution that I find is probably this one here. Yeah, because, uh, well, I don't have any closer integral point to my LP solution. So uh, the ILP solution can be far from the LP solution. ILP and the LP solution can be very different. Okay. Um, I have now also shown what happens if I choose a different reward vector. Uh, this is the purple vector here. Um, so the Okay, first let me find the proper the ILP solution for the pink vector. The ILP solution for the pink vector I claim would be this one. Because amongst the red points, it is the one which lies furthest in the direction of my pink vector. For the purple vector, I would claim that uh, the LP solution is the same. So I pick the same corner of my polyhedron, but the ILP solution this time is different yeah? because the ILP solution is probably, you know, if I'm seeing this correctly, is this one over there. Yeah? So if two problems have the same LP solution, it can still be the case that they have different ILP solutions. Now we have been able to figure out the LP and ILP solution by just looking at the problem, yeah, because we had uh, two variables and three constraints. But in reality, we have a million variables and a million constraints. Yeah? So we're working on, in this million dimensional space and we cannot just look at the problem to, to find the optimum solution. And so we need a strategy and a branch and bound is a good strategy here. So what one can do is um, start with the, let's uh, take the purple case here. Let's start with the LP solution. This is what I find. And now I find that it's fractional in both in the X and the Y coordinates. So I can now introduce a new constraint and say that I want my solution to be uh, below this purple line. Or I could say I want my solution to be above the upper purple line, but the intersection of being above the upper purple line and in my original polyhedron is zero, so I'm omitting this. Okay, so I can now say I want to be below the purple line, and now I can find a new solution. Um, which, under the purple vector, where, where will it be? The bottom, right. bottom right? No, I don't think so. Oh, okay. So we want to point as far as possible in this direction. And we want to be in the yellow area. And we want to be under the horizontal purple line. This point here, okay? This would be the first LP solution. And then after I've been branching, this would be the second LP solution. And 
the second LP solution. So first, is everybody happy with that? Yeah, so it's inside the yellow region and it's beyond the horizontal line. And it's the one which points furthest in this direction here. Yeah. It is, that's a good question. It's partially integral. Yeah. So uh, if we look at this coordinate here, uh, mu two is integral, but mu one is not yet integral. So we now start to branch on mu one. Yeah, I say I now consider two subproblems. One is that I must be to the right of this new line, and the other is I must be to the left of that line. So now I have two polyhedra. Uh, let's say I have this polyhedron here, and I have that polyhedron. And now, uh, given all of these constraints, I again try and find the best solution. So in the one polyhedron, my new solution is now actually going to be here. And in the other polyhedron, it is going to be, I think, there. Now, my third solution is completely integral. My fourth solution is not integral. And, uh, you know, depending on the precise direction of the reward vector, if my relaxed solution or if my non-integral solution has a worse reward than my integral solution, then I know that I don't need to pursue this subspace any longer because if I now impose integrality in addition, you know, it can only become worse, the reward. It cannot become better. And even if, even without integrality, my reward here in the left polyhedron is already worse than my integral solution in the right polyhedron, then I am, then I know I'm done. And I've made a mistake, by the way, because my polyhedron here on the right is only allowed to go to here. I forgot the horizontal purple line. Okay, um, so this strategy is called branch and bound, and you can uh, you can arrange this in a tree. Yeah, you can say at first I had my LP solution, and then I branched on uh, mu two, and uh, on the one side, I found that, uh, well, my feasible set became empty. On the other side, I found a new fractional, or I found this partially integral solution. This was the solution two. And then I've been branching on the first variable, and I ended up with two solutions, three and four. And uh, three was already integral, and uh, four was fractional. And uh, three, in fact, gave me a better reward than four. So I know that I don't need to branch any further here because uh, it cannot possibly get any better. This is why it's called branch and bound. Okay, so branch and bound repeatedly solves linear programs. Just possibly very, very many of them. Uh, in fact, you know, when with millions of variables, millions of constraints, we may need to solve millions of linear programs. Uh, and uh, this is why, you know, you may in real life you may get stuck and never get a solution in, in your lifetime. Now, somehow I've glossed over the problem of how do we solve these linear programming problems. And I don't want to discuss it now in this course in detail. There are essentially two strategies. One is called the simplex strategy, where first you need to find some corner of your polytope, and then you iteratively move along the boundaries of your polytope from one corner to the next until you get to the best LP solution. Um, whereas an interior point method, uh, this is, you know, uh, always reminds me, you know, of some, some physics problem. Yeah? So let's say 
uh, in LP, uh, in, in an interior point method, uh, let's say you have some electric charge, you need to find a position inside your polytope, you need to find a feasible position, and then you apply an electric field, uh, also known as the reward, and then of course the electric field tries to go in the direction of, or the, the charge tries to go in the direction of the electric field. However, uh, we now have these constraints, and uh, these constraints you impose by introducing an electrostatic repulsion. Yeah? So each of these things here is a, uh, is a plane or a plate which, uh, re which repels your charge. And uh, the kind of potential that is being used is called a lock barrier. Yeah? So the potential at one of these walls goes to infinity goes to infinity as you approach the plate. And then you, uh, you simply try and find the equilibrium position of this uh, electrostatic system. And then you make your potential uh, a little harder and a little harder and a little harder and uh, solve this iteratively until your charge ends up infinitely close or infinitesimally close uh, to one of the corners at which point you are done. This is uh, the interior point method and these are the two most successful classes of algorithms to solve the linear programming problem. Okay, now a question to you. Uh, if we look at, so we have two ingredients. Yeah? We have on the one hand the shape of the polytope and on the other hand the direction of the reward vector. Can you, you know, think about how does that relate to our original Markov random field problem? Which part of the Markov random field manifests itself in which of these aspects of the optimization problem? So you need to remember that we somehow have a factor graph associated with this thing. Yeah? So we somehow have a factor graph that we have with much effort translated into uh, integer linear program. Yeah? And the question is which of these aspects is manifested in what part of this optimization problem? Okay, we'll add that to the homework. <laughs> it's a, I think it's a good question. Um, okay. Uh, let me come to a summary here. Um, the maximum a posteriori estimation problem in discrete Markov random fields can always be formulated as an integer linear programming problem. But by just doing that, we have not won anything yeah, because the problem may be too large to solve. Uh, practical consequences are we either need to resort to approximations and you will work with one of these in uh, the exercises or we need to give the Markov random field a special structure. Yeah? We need to limit our modeling freedom to obtain an optimization problem that is simpler. Yeah? And uh, one famous example is, so for example, if we have a binary pairwise 
Markov random field with only attractive pairwise interactions. Then we get out a polygon that has only integral vertices. And what's the consequence in terms of branch and bound and so on? So the polygon that I showed here, the corners, were not integral. What if I had a polygon which only has integral corners? Yeah? Exactly. So uh, then it's enough to use the LP solver because if all corners are integral, then the first LP problem that I solve will already give me an integral solution and then I know I'm done. There's no need to branch any further, no need for any further work. Yeah. Um, and so somehow this fact um, what is easy to optimize and what is difficult to optimize has huge repercussions on the on the modeling. Yeah? So as a, if I now am designing a computer vision pipeline, I have the choice to either use a rich model, which may be impossible to solve to global optimality, or I can choose to restrict myself to a model which I know can be optimized efficiently, such as a binary pairwise Markov random field with attractive interactions only. Um, and uh, you know, by and large, up to 2010 or 15, uh, people went with the latter strategy. So they restricted their modeling freedom in favor of uh, models that would allow them to give uh, to get the globally optimal solution. And since I would say the tide has turned and people look at uh, richer models that can, however, only be solved approximately. And now this was more of a you know general comment. It doesn't only refer to these MRFs because uh, all of this neural network optimization falls into this class of problems that, that cannot be solved optimally. Uh, but still, these methods perform extremely well in practice, uh, even when only an, a local optimum is found. OK, so any more questions from you? So what will, you have a question? Um, that can happen, yes. So uh, it, it now, dep oh, uh, sorry, better than two, no, never. It can only, uh, so solution two could be better than solution three, but uh, solution four could be better than solution three, but it cannot be better than solution two, because when we go down this tree, we have always uh, added a constraint. And whenever we add a constraint, we somehow, you know, we cannot possibly increase the reward. We can only decrease it. But now the question between the solution three and four, it depends on the exact angle that my reward vector is pointing to. Yeah, if I can already uh, uh, stop so if, if I can bound at this stage or if I need to continue. Yeah? So sometimes I need to continue further down the tree on the left-hand side, but then I see, okay, the best solution that I find in the subtree four is no better than the one that I've already found at three and then I'm done. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So if, uh, to the solution tool, we just, uh, yes, we always invoke the LP solver on increasingly smaller uh, parts of the 
polytope. Okay, so uh, let's look again what happened at, at three. Uh, sorry, at solution two. Solution two was integral in one component, but it was fractional in mu one. And uh, so we know that, okay, we want an integral solution out. So I'm asking, so for example, you know, let's make this more concrete. Let's say the solution two, let's say that this had the coordinates mu one, what is it? One, two, let's say 2.6 and mu two was 1.0. And so now I'm branching here. I'm imposing the condition that the extra condition that mu one must be no less than three. And here I'm imposing the condition that mu one must be no more than two. Okay, and so I get out two new problems, which I then continue to study. Yes? Solution is fractional or not. Ah, I just look at the, you know, I get a vector out, I just look at the entries. If each entry in my vector is a whole number, then it's integral, and otherwise it's fractional. Mm -hmm. uh, if the extra constraints randomly generated? No, or... no, no, they're not randomly generated. It's, um, you know, if, uh, if I was already happy with mu2, but I was not happy with mu one because it was uh, because it was fractional. Huh? Then uh, I take the the ceiling of two point six and I take the floor of two point six. Yeah, to generate new cuts. And now, by the way, these are the simplest conceivable cuts. So there is a whole science of uh, it's a huge scientific field of uh, what constraints do you want to, uh, so how do you formulate your problem in the first place? And then what kind of cuts do you want to use? What is random, however, is if you have several fractional variables. Yeah? So let's say if we have, if we have not two, but if we have uh, three variables, then I can decide randomly if I want to now branch on mu one or if I want to branch on mu three is the next, in the next step of my branching. Yeah? So this, this is random. And then there are of course heuristics of which is maybe the better idea. But the constraints themselves are not generated randomly. Yeah? So if I didn't like 2.6, it means it either has to be larger than 2.6, that must be at least three or smaller than 2.6, that means at most two. There was another question, I think. Anyone else? Um, so, something if I calculate uh, the seal on the floor, do I take the uh, point of each hydrant or the point of each, but the left of one of them or the right of one over each line? I didn't understand the question. Can you can speak you up, please? Have a M1, and uh, you calculate the ceiling and the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, the, the new uh, polytop is uh, <coughs> inside with two lines, for example. Yeah. So um, at this stage, at the so you know uh, in the first LP, this was my polytop. After this, after the second LP, uh, my polytope looked like this, and the other one was not had no feasible region at all. And now at the third place, I get, like you say, I get two polytopes. I have these two new constraints, and now I get one polytope to the left, and I get one polytope to the right. And these are the two children of the node number two. Yeah? So I have this binary tree. Okay, 
So um, the main point of today was two things. On the one hand, I wanted to show you a little bit what is the modeling freedom. So not all Markov random fields need to live on a Cartesian lattice. Yeah? Sometimes you can have much more complicated, higher order and so on. And the other main statement was this one, that map estimation can always be cast as an integer linear program. And next time we will look at special MRFs uh, that induce integer linear programs with special structure and that can be solved more efficiently. See you then.